Today, I'm going to be speaking with Mike Rinder, who's a former senior executive of the Church of Scientology, as well as the C organization. Uh, Mike, it's so great to have you on today. Thanks, David. It's lovely to be here. So I've interviewed both first and second generation Scientology members. I know that often the dynamics for one's relationship to Scientology are different depending on whether your parents were, were uh, um, already part of it when you were born or not. Talk to us a little bit about your path in. OK, I'm a second generation Scientologist. My parents got involved in Scientology in Australia. Uh, when Hubbard went there to do some lectures in 1959. And so from a very young age, I was raised in a Scientology family. And then uh, once I finished high school, I joined what's called the Sea Organization, which is the like the elite inner core of Scientology, people that devote their entire lives to uh, supposedly achieving the aims of the religion. They sign a billion year contract. Yep. Billion. Right. Uh, because Scientologists believe that you live many different lifetimes and your spirit transcends bodies. And so you commit yourself basically to an eternity of service of Scientology. And I did that from the age of uh, 18 until I left when I was 53. So there, there's already five branching paths we, we could go down here. Let's <laughs> let's address a few maybe of the, the, the sort of uh, nuts and bolts. You say when you finished high school, is yes. Scientology big on people that are part of the Sea Org not going to college? Absolutely. Hubbard. I mean, everything in Scientology is based on what Hubbard's view of things are. And yeah. Hubbard had a very negative opinion of uh, educational systems and educational institutions, partly because he dropped out of college. Um, but also he figured that he had uh, come up with a tech, a quote, technology of study that made everything else sort of irrelevant. And because he believed that Scientology addresses everything there is to know about life and the world, that it was far more important for children to be educated in Scientology than educated in, quote, WOG, meaning non-Scientology stuff. Got it. And then in terms of the Sea Org, I know that other Sea Org, former Sea Org folks I've spoken to say they got no salary. They basically got housing. And then that was part of the way that the church would exert control over them. Was that your situation? Yeah, absolutely, David. That's every, everybody who is in the Sea Organization is becomes basically an indentured servant to right. the to the organization of Scientology. In other words, you live, you eat, your health care, whatever it may be, is provided by Scientology. You don't earn uh, money per se. You get what's called a stipend, which can range from nothing to $50 a week, maybe if you're lucky. And you so you have no resources available. You Most Sea Org members do not own a vehicle. They don't own a house. They don't have any sort of worldly means. Many of them uh, joined the Sea Organization even younger than I did. They don't even have a high school diploma. They don't have any anything that allows them or would allow them to walk out into the real world and carry on a normal life. So the fear within the Sea Organization, and, it, and it's something that is cultivated, is that stepping outside of the Sea Organization is going to be a tantamount to committing suicide. You know, there, there's this old uh, joke, not so much a joke, but a statement that goes around in the in the Sea Org is if you leave the Sea Org, all you'll do is end up living under a bridge or flipping burgers at McDonald's mm. that you don't have any 
any other avenue to pursue in life other than what we are offering you. So at some point you start to work your way up and you start to actually uh, you, you eventually become chief spokesperson and representative of Scientology to the media at that point, or maybe to put it a different way. At what point did you start to have doubts about your uh, everything that, that you were doing and what you had been told? I started to have doubts um, probably about five years before I left. And I left in 2007, so okay. in the early 2000s. But you have to understand, David, that having doubts is th there is this enormous push and pull of what you've been taught in Scientology, and there is a very fundamental principle that Hubbard uses to you know, hang on to people, which is that your condition, whatever, whatever condition you find yourself in, is your own, you've caused that. That you've caused, if it's a bad state of affairs, you've caused it by doing bad things. And so, when you and, and it even is down to the level of if you're contemplating leaving this organization, it means that you've done bad things to this organization. Mm. So you get this push and pull. Oh, my God, something's wrong here. Oh, my Scientology teaching tells me that that's because I've done something bad and I need to look inside within myself and figure out what that is. So. And there are a lot of other factors that go into it. Like I had two children and a wife. If I decide I wish to leave, then that becomes a problem because if I tell my wife, she's probably going to report me mm. and then I'll be stopped. If I don't tell her I'm going to lose my wife and children. So there's a, and, and that's just, the sort of most surface factors that so go talk into a little this. bit about the concept I've heard before about I will be prevented from leaving. And what I want to understand is it, as a general thing, someone calls the police and says they're being held against their will, for example, and police show up and, and you know, you don't even really need a warrant in that situation. You're able to verify someone's well-being. Did you even have access to a phone? Could you even call police if you are being held against your will? Well, this this depends on where you're at. If I you see. were at where I was at Golden Era Productions, the international headquarters of Scientology in Riverside County, you don't have commonly access to a phone and the phones that are there in order to be able to make any call you have to go via reception i see but beneath that david is there is another very well inculcated idea in scientology that going to the police or law enforcement is a big no-no this is just not done nobody goes to call the police or do something that is outside of the world of Scientology to solve a problem within Scientology. Now, obviously, if you're if you're at the point where you're ready to jump the fence and run down the, the highway in the middle of nowhere and hope that someone's going to pick you up, then you're not in that mindset. But it takes a lot of a lot of uh, thinking outside the bubble that you exist in to get to that point. Right. And by, by very definition, because you're in a bubble of agreed upon thoughts and ideas and everybody else agrees with you and what's right and what's wrong is all agreed upon, it's very difficult to think outside that bubble. So that's... That's why Larry Wright so cleverly called his book Going Clear Scientology and the Prison of Belief, because though there are security guards, there's lights, there's motion sensors on the fences, there's cameras everywhere, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, the real prison of Scientology and particularly Sea Org members is here. Right. And did your some of the former Scientology people I've spoken to, 
started to take issue with the practices as an organization, but almost continued having the doctrine beliefs even after they left. Were your doubts with one, the other or both? With primarily one, the the organization and David Miscavige. Interesting. So and your initial problem was not you didn't believe the that aliens previously were here or Z, you weren't doubting that you were doubting the organization. Correct. It wow. takes it takes. And, I, you know, I obviously have spoken to a lot of former Scientologists, and a lot of former Sea Org members. It, it's sort of like a stage of uh, peeling the onion, of unburdening yourself of ideas that have been sort of built into your DNA almost, particularly if you're raised that way. And. The easiest ones are the ones that have a very physical manifestation, like being beaten up by David Miscavige is something that's a very, you know, tangible here and now thing. The ideas of that Dianetics and Hubbard's book Dianetics is a load of bunk takes a lot longer to get sort of shed because it's it's not so it's not so tangible. That makes a lot of sense. And I, I mean, when when you it, it seems as though it takes in a sense more, although in a physical sense, the decision to leave or try to leave uh, seems like the piece that's most difficult. It seems that maybe the beliefs that have been ingrained in you your entire life are really the most difficult, although in a different way. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right, David. Ab and I don't think that there is anybody that you will ever talk to who is a former Scientologist that will tell you anything different than that. Mm. You I were think it's um, a shared experience. You you talk talk about what it means to be in the hole and your experience in the hole for two years. It's um, well, it's really a prison. It was a, a prison that was created at the international headquarters by David Miscavige in a uh, double wide trail, a building that was constructed out of two double wide trailers and the doors were barred and the windows were screwed shut. And there was a security guard at the only access point to the building and we were put in there to um, figure out why we were suppressive persons. Mm. And a suppressive person in Scientology means someone who is intent upon destroying mankind. Right. And Miscavige, David Miscavige, the, the ecclesiastical leader of the Scientology religion, as he likes to call himself, was... Um, always seeking to be the person who was the dog, the big dog, the dominant personality in the environment and kept anybody who was a potential threat to his control of the organization constantly in a state of am I in trouble? Am I not in trouble? Am I going to be, you know, sent to, to shovel sh in Louisiana, am I am I in good graces today? And the whole was sort of the final manifestation of this, where he basically took everybody who was at the senior echelon of Scientology and put them in this prison and said, when you guys figure out why you're so bad, maybe you can get out. Right. And that devolved in this, you know, Going Clear gives a pretty good depiction of some of what happened, the, the Alex Gibney movie, the HBO movie. But the, the, the truth of the matter is it devolved into a sort of a Lord of the Flies world of people striving to demonstrate to David Miscavige that they were more on his team than anybody else by attacking 
the other people and saying, you know, you're a bad person or beating them up or yelling at them or, you know, famously in the case of Debbie Cook, who was put there and testified on the stand right. that she was put in a garbage can with a sign around her neck and people poured water over her until she was shivering and and uh, being physically and, and verbally abused. This happened as the sort of um, routine that ended up being in the hole. And it was pretty, pretty uh, both bizarre and horrifying and shocking and uh, a little unbelievable to think that that uh, could be happening in today's United States of America. Yeah. Well, I think that's that's the question a lot of people in the audience have, which is how is how is it happening? We're going to continue our conversation and the full conversation will be posted on our YouTube channel. We're, we're going to go to a break on the podcast, TV and radio show. Uh, we've been speaking, of course, with Mike Rinder, a former senior executive of the Church of Scientology and the Sea Org. The full conversation will be on our YouTube channel. Uh, Mike, when it comes to medical treatment, we've many of us have seen the Tom Cruise video about when it comes to psychiatry and mental health and curing addiction, nobody can do what Scientology, you know, et cetera. For, yeah. In the day to day, if you have a sinus infection, does Scientology just say you take an antibiotic? I mean, it, it, it generally speaking, how what's the perspective on traditional standard medical treatment? OK, this is this is a, a question that has uh, an answer that isn't black and white. Mm. Generally, Scientologists do not uh, have a great deal of faith in the medical profession. Okay. Um, absolutely black and white. They have absolutely no faith in any psychiatric, psychological, sure. mental health field. That is absolutely taboo. Medical doctors are seen as a, sort of a necessary evil, like if you break your leg, you need to have a doctor to set the bones. If you have a, a sinus infection, like you said, if it can't be cured with Scientology touch assists, which is a thing that Hubbard invented on. Uh oh, Mike, we just lost you there. Oh boy. In Scientology, then you probably will be sent to a doctor, and if if Mike, we got your audio back for a second, but we totally lost you your video. There? OK, Am now you're back. Now you're back. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh. Uh, I'm back. You're back. OK, where did you get to, Dave? <laughs> we, we really got most of it that when it comes to, you know, ideally with maybe with the touch points, something could be solved. But if not, there would be a reluctant acceptance of medical treatment. Yeah, Hubbard, Hubbard had a very dim view of the medical profession because they did not accept Dianetics. Right. And he believed that Dianetics was the cure for all of man's ills, including physical ills. I mean, Dianetics, the book, still contains all these passages that say this cures bursitis and arthritis and heart disease and blah, 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 blah. Um, pretty radical claims of medical results that don't exist. But the other concept in Scientology is that illness only happens and you are predisposed to being becoming ill if you are connected to one of these suppressive people. Yeah. Uh, and that's not that different from ideas from other religions that illness is a result of either not praying enough or the right way or of some kind of sin. Absolutely. I mean, there are a lot of things in Scientology that are not a whole lot different than other religions. Mm. What is different about Scientology is the one of the things about Scientology that sets it apart is that Hubbard wrote down everything. He wrote everything and made it available to people within Scientology. And that includes all of his um, directives to destroy people, use private investigators, 
disassociate and disconnect families, to uh, eradicate enemies, to destroy psychiatry. All of this stuff is written down. It's all like in black and white writing by Hubbard. And this is what Scientologists practice and, and believe. And, you know, it's, it's certainly okay to believe anything you want. You can believe in space aliens. You can believe the earth is flat. You can believe that there was a virgin birth. All of these things, there's plenty of radical beliefs that exist in all sorts of mainstream religious thought. What you can't do is do things that hurt and harm people. Right. And do things that are in violation of the law. And that's what, you know those of us that call ourselves whistleblowers about Scientology are seeking to end. We're not trying to end Scientology as a thought process or a belief system. We're trying to end the abuses, the families being broken up, people being bankrupted, uh, you know, people being harassed, that stuff. That's that's where the the crux of the problem with Scientology is. In, in summary, when you left, did the wife and kids go with you? And what degree of harassment have you experienced since leaving? OK, no, my wife and kids did not go with me. Um, I wrote to them as soon as I had a spot to settle in and asked if they would come and my wife at the time wrote back a, a very uh, terse letter saying, F you, mm. I'm filing the divorce papers. Um, as for harassment, uh, pretty much the whole gamut. I've had spies sent in on me and GPS devices put on my cars and cameras set up outside my homes, my garbage taken and gone through. Yeah, the going uh, through massive... for some reason, Scientology investigators seem to love r riffling through garbage. Everybody <laughs> I've spoken to mentions that. Well, it's it's sort of a it's like a, a technique that that private investigators use uh, because and, and Scientology use because yeah. People tend to be uh, pretty careless about their garbage. And there's all sorts of things that you might find in there. It's not like you're going to find your, you know, the the admission that, oh, I stole $10,000 from Scientology, but maybe a pill bottle that shows what prescription you're taking. Right. Or maybe, you know, it, there's all sorts of information to be gleaned from that. But today, I think that Scientology's biggest uh, means of seeking to harass people who are speaking out about it is on the internet. I mean, they're a massive, they have a massive number of websites and URLs, and they're on Twitter, and they're on Facebook, and they're all over the place spreading ridiculous lies about everybody. I mean, and, and it's funny to look at them, David, because you see almost every person is got the same uh, modifiers and adjectives used to describe them. Mm. They're bitter, they're defrocked, they've got an axe to grind, they're a thief, they're a liar, they're a this, they're a that. And it, I think that one thing that the aftermath accomplished when we kept showing or reading the letters that Scientology would send about all the people that we're talking about was to discredit the, the barrage that Scientology puts forth about anybody who says anything. I mean, you're probably going to get something about you now. You know, Just I've done because. a lot of these and I haven't so far that I've seen. But yeah, I, I've, it's, I've considered it could happen. Well, yeah, you haven't done me. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, listen, there was there was one other thing I wanted to ask about to get your insight into this. About a decade ago, my mom acts. I mean, she she deliberately hired a handyman that she did not know was a Scientologist until after she hired him. And when she was on vacation, she asked me to just check in on how the work was going. And the guy let slip. Uh, Hey, have you ever heard of L. Ron Hubbard? And I could tell that this was sort of an initial entreaty to kind of gauge my reaction. And I said, yeah, the science fiction guy who made up Scientology. Right. And he immediately told me, oh, that's what suppressive people say. Really kind of jumping right in. Right. right. But here's the detail I'm curious about. The next day when I went to check on the work, 
he had left an outgoing letter in my mom's mailbox to the Church of Scientology in Philadelphia, where his son worked. He could have sent this from anywhere. He could have sent it from his house. He could have dropped it off at the post office. Is there I mean, maybe you're speculating, but is there some signal that he was maybe trying to send to me or to the Postal Service about my mom in some way? What's the point of sending this letter from my mom's house? I think he was just lazy. Oh, okay. I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 There's I nothing no so special about that. That was just stupid. <laughs> okay. He also was a Rush Limbaugh fan. I don't know if politically Scientology tends to be conservative in that way. Oh, yes. Okay. Gen generally, I would say that Scientology is conservative for, and, and this is really for two reasons, David. One, because if there is something related to psychiatry, that is a live or die one decision issue for mm. all Scientologists. So if Democrats are proposing uh, health care for all, which includes oh, mental yeah. health. I see. No way. I see. Absolutely I see. No way. And the second thing is that Hubbard generally was very anti-government. You know, the government uh, of the United States and Britain and Australia and South Africa and New I mean, governments everywhere, France, everywhere always were after him. So he always announced very loudly to his followers that, you know, governments are composed of bad people trying to do bad things to destroy mankind and enslave people and blah, blah, blah. And so the idea of big government is anathema generally to Scientologists. That makes that makes a lot of sense when thought of uh, when thought of that way. We've been yeah. speaking with Mike Rinder, former senior executive of the Church of Scientology and the Sea Org. Mike, it's been such a pleasure having you on. Thanks for telling us your story. You're very welcome, David. It's been a pleasure being with you.